Jesus Christ, freaking in. Let's go get a long shot at Tenton! Oh! Welcome everybody to episode 13 of the Black Tank Football Hour podcast. My name is Mark DePoli, your host for the 13 shows before this, the 13 shows after this, as we hit the halfway point, or just on the halfway point uh, in our season. So I'll just tell you now, um, in about two weeks or fortnight's time from now, there won't be an episode. We're going to take a week off uh, and just sort of have a recap and a rethink of what we need to do for the second half of the, of the season, both podcast-wise, football-wise, everything-wise. So we're just going to take a little break from there. So uh, you can expect an episode next week, and then we'll just take one off. So um, I'm keen for the little break, um, but keen for the amount of time I'll get to spend planning on the next couple of episodes after that. So um, this is just a reminder now, um, fortnight from now. Uh, but until then, you've got two episodes to enjoy until that, that one week off. And I'm sure you'll recover from the emotional sadness that comes with not having an episode for a week. I'm not sure where you'll put that extra hour. Um, perhaps you might be crying by yourself, and that's fair enough. I will be too. Um, tears of happiness. So yeah, we're looking forward to the interesting stories that I can uh, search and discover for uh, in that little one-week break, and that's what I'm going to use that time for most certainly. So I'm speaking about stories. So let's say you're a coach uh, and you have an undefeated under 15s Division Three side. I want to hear about that. Why? How did you guys become undefeated? What's your philosophy? What does training look like? How do you coach as a coach? I'm interested in that. Are you, for example, an over 35s team uh, where 90% of your players started 10 years ago and uh, are still here today? I'll bring the microphone and the camera to a training and I'll come and take a bit of footage. I'll have a chat to you after the game. We can chat about what makes your team chemistry so good. What does it take to have that many committed players stick around for that long? That fits, if that's your billing, if that sounds like something your team has, let me know. Or perhaps you're a long time servant of the club. Uh, are you a, a committee? Member, are you a volunteer, a player, a coach who spent, I don't know, 10 plus years at a club as well? I'm interested. What motivates you to get out of bed on a Saturday and Sunday morning, getting down, setting up fields? I want to know. I'm interested. My email, as will be popping up now, is media at bdsfa.com. Uh, the inbox is always open, even though for some reason I don't actually get notifications on my phone anymore when I get an email, but on the computer I do, uh, which is always open. So that's fantastic. So if you're watching along and you either fit that billing or you know someone who fits that billing, reach out. Reach out to them, ask them, and then maybe they can send me an email. We're looking for good stories here. There are good stories out there. I just want to find them and bring them to the surface. So, let's shine a light on those who deserve their attention. All right? Now, what can you expect from the rest of this episode? We have three interviews coming your way, uh, and three very different interviews coming your way. So, stick around and I'll tell you all about them. The first one is something I think you'll find really exciting, especially if you're a young player. Blacktown Spartans, Melbourne City, uh, and young Matilda's goalkeeper Sally James is currently taking a break from her, um, her from Spartans duty to go uh, and train with the young Matildas, um, and she's also then taking a break from that intense training camp um, in preparation for the Under 23 Women's World Cup uh, in August, um, and she's going to take you through what preparation is like for a tournament like that, a squad of 27 that she's a part of. So 10 Blacktown Spartans players, as you might have seen on social media in the last couple of days have made that squad of 27, which is over uh, a third of the squad, and we're extremely proud of that little change of scenery, as you can tell, uh, and of clothing as well, uh, back inside for the rest of the Blacktown Football Hour podcast, or at least my section of it. Um, there was an audio issue, so I've had to reshoot. Professional, I know. Up next, uh, after we speak to Sally James, uh, we have a look uh, at Ropes Crossing Strikers, who are finally featuring in our Premier League Match of the Round. Uh, we spoke to Jared, uh, who's one of their uh, players who played last season and this season, um, and he's been through the whole squad refresh, as you'll be able to watch uh, in the second segment. So do stick around for that. Um, they've had a roller coaster of a couple of years, coaching changes and the like. So if you want to hear more detail about that and how you should expect them to line up, perhaps in at least some sort of tactical insight uh, comes tomorrow night, stick around. Uh, and finally, the final interviewee uh, of this Blackdown Football Hour podcast, episode 13, is actually me. Uh, Bill Owen, our wonderful chairman for Spartans and BDSFA, uh, said to me while I was working at my desk, he said, come next door, we're going to ask you a couple of questions about yourself. So if you want to find out what my favourite food is, for example, uh, among other equally important uh, football-related topics, Stick around as well. Third time I've said that, but I encourage you, stick around. 
Then, of course, there's also the, without mentioning the highlights packages and goal of the week and uh, the normal results that we look over. And speaking of those results, I think we should get into that right now. So, let's begin with the all-age Division 1 women's. Um, so, Glenwood played a Thursday night game away to uh, Greystains, the GDSFA side, uh, 1-3-2 on their own home soil. Uh, come then Sunday, Holroyd Rangers uh, beat Quakers Juniors 4-1. Rydal Mean remained too good uh, and won 2-0 over Marion. Glenwood responded with a 6-0 win over Doonside, uh, while Park Lee beat Greystains on the road 2-1. Uh, on Tuesday, in the more catch-up games, uh, Park Lee beat Horroyd 5-0. Greystains beat Juniors 2-0, and Marion won 7-1 uh, over Doonside away from home. A look at the table as it comes up on the screen now as well. Doonside still searching for their first points of the season. Uh, juniors above them with a single point after a draw earlier on in the season. Marion, two wins from eight above them. Glenwood in the mid-table spot, shared with Greystains just above them. Uh, Holroyd and then uh, ahead of them as well. In third, Parkley second, and Rydalmere with an almost uh, completely uh, perfect record, sitting pretty in first. On to the deploy, de deploy PL2, I should say. St. Pat's and Minchinbury played out a very entertaining three-all draw. Prospect dumped on Glenwood's parade after their first win of the season. They beat them 4-1. Uh, Oakville actually beat Spurs 6-0, but the reserve grade had insufficient numbers of players, meaning that the first grade squad then suffered a 3-0 forfeit loss. Shake up off the table, coming up indeed. Quakers, Tigers in the match of the round beat Eastern Creek. Here's your highlights package for that. Long that goes, and straight away, and maybe a chance for Brian Grandamage to get another goal to his tout this season. No, oh, he's pulled it wide of that far post. Goal and assist King. It's McLennan over the wall into the hands of Sayer, who fumbles the first one, claims the second one. 35-year-old scored his first goal in eight years, he says, last week against Minchinbrina, 7-0 thumping. In behind now, and Arujo, Arujo, Ben Marsh, what a save, and then cleared. Clears, flicked on Snowden, Grand Manger's offside, these two have to do it together. O'Hanlon looking for the ball back in behind, Snowden, still Jaden Snowden, looks to feed in. Oh, what a touch, and then O'Hanlon, goal! Kieran O'Hanlon starting tonight in place of Billy Seck, one goal all season in first grade, make it two! Eastern Creek behind early, Tigers in front of their adoring home fans in front. And that'll give them the confidence they need to keep rolling on. Deeth in the game. What a ball that is. That's so flat and perfect. Oh, oh across the face. So similar to like that one that we saw in the first five minutes. Down the other end. Catley Bond into the box. Keating is there. He jazz is there. Was there a hint of a handball there? So don't be too worried if this just ends with only one in the first half. Again, now consecutive matches. Never ever has there been a nil all. Let's hope that remains forever. At the back stick, cheeky Matt Harrison run coming in. It's going to go towards him to Harrison. In. Oh, oh, it's gone in! I called it! Call me Mystic Mark. That's gone and found the 40 year old at the back stick. He's got a couple of goals and assists to his name. And now he's put one on in the most important match of the season so far. He was left completely unmarked. And the ball came perfectly to him. Elbra passed his man into the box again. Keating is there. One touch. Probably should have hit it first time. Keating, no! Ricochet, will it stay in? It does. Enough for Ben Marsh to claim. Matt's Ferru still high up the pitch. Now when it comes by McClendon again, what a pass it was. But snuffed out. And then on the volley! Oh, what a save by Sayer. And then cleared. Eastern Creek desperately hoping rather than to get a goal back before half time, not to go down by three. Almost, almost there, but they've given it away. Huge chance to do something here. Brian Sohn, he's just going to beat the keeper. Brian Sohn, hard the deficit. No! He's missed it, but was he taken out? No, not at all, says the referee. Four sub onto the pitch now. I'm not exactly sure who it is. I'll let you know when I can. In it comes. It's a dangerous looking ball. Ben Marsh didn't come. Now I'd be cleared. Oh, what a save on the line there. I think it was. Maybe now on the follow up. Sliding's happening everywhere. Scuffle to find the ball. It's cleared finally in that league, and we'll be hoping to. Really, do something bright here. No offside flag has been raised, though. And for, oh, that's going to be a red card. There was no ball there. Huge, huge shouts for this to be a dark shade of colour. What's it going to be? Nothing at all. And it comes. Over the wall. Nick Sayar saves the first one. O'Hanlon is there. Back to goal. They'll try and whip it in again through Deef. Crosses the touch. I know it didn't. Still in play. 
And now a little more comprehensively here. Miskin does what he's been doing all game. Might even line up the shot himself. He's then lost it. Big slide tackle in there. Oh, and it might even prove the greatest pass of all time. Another massive tackle in there. One by those in yellow. Cleared by Mitch McLennan. Could that be the ball of the century? It might be. Grand Major's there. Slid in by Nick Sayer, and he did really well. It was a sudden change. Kemp does really well to get past Arujo. Not afraid to come forward. Still Kemp. Brendan Kemp then goes wide. And now into the box. Deeth. Fizzes it back across. Oh! How did it miss? O'Hanlon wins it back. What a touch. And now this could be the chance to seal it. Oh, straight at the keeper. It's just not an attack. It's finished. And oh! Oh, my word. A miss of the season contender there. How on earth has this game not been put beyond all doubt? That last name has French act doesn't matter because Grandemange has a chance to make amends for what he just did there. Ah, oh, straight at the keeper again. Up the line it goes. Doesn't find anyone but Scott Young and Yalza coloured jersey. Flick on is nice there by Arujo. And then Soren tries to find Keating. Could this be game on here? Great save by Ben Marsh, who went to ground at the perfect time. Appeals not leading to anything. That might do it. That will do it. Tigers are strong at home and met with a wonderful reception by their home fans who have braved the cold and the mudded out grass to stay here for the full 90 minutes tonight. They were dominant. Uh, Matt, uh, we just we just finished our own chat about the game and, and now we're putting it to camera. So, look, it's it, it wasn't the, the best performance. Uh, you won't need to say that. I think we, we can watch it back and see that. So, you know, you, you told me you had no training this week. So how do you pick back up and change that now? Oh, look, it's not hard to pick back up. I think you saw in the first 20 minutes today, we were out in thirst. It was second to every ball. It's a bad lighting. It's a horrible... Like, we were just off it, right? We, it's just the ground where we, we didn't play well here last year. I think it's just in their heads, mate. We, I don't think... Look, they deserve the win. They, they battled hard and they were quicker. Just did the basics right, mate. We didn't do it. Brian Soane's through one-on-one takes three touches, maybe it was two more than he needed to. Right on the cusp of half time, that goes in, half of the deficit going into the second half. Do you look back at that and, and then go back and watch it back and, and, and focus on that, or do you just go, yeah, yeah you missed look, it and that was it? Uh, yeah, look, to be fair, we've probably been that game because yep. we had enough chances to win it. We've been like that all season, and and at some point you're gonna, it's going to cost you. Today it cost us. You know, again, Nick probably kept us in the game in goals, did well. Um, look, at, to be fair, it stems from last week. We beat Minchinbury 7-0 in a canter. We get a centre-back sent off for a, a, a really, really, really like horrible decision from a referee, and we're now the tenth centre-back pairing. So, hey, it's just numbers. But, Clark, Quakers Hill, they deserve their win today. For sure. All right, my friend. Thanks, Thank Mark. You. Thanks again, mate. Appreciate it. No, you can all get in. It doesn't. I can say that. He's a man of the content. I'm joined by. Jeez, I'm so sorry. Mitch McLennan, a late sub there. Uh, Brandon Camp, who played the full 90 minutes. Taryn Rockle, who is the coach, um, and uh, would be thrilled with what she's seen just then. I imagine. Am I correct? Yes, very much so. The boys did very well. Dug in and uh, played a good hard effort and come away with a good, good result. Uh, Brandon, you're one of the leaders in this team. Um, don't, might not have the captain's armband on your, on your on your right shoulder or your left shoulder, but uh, you're certainly contributing with the full 90 minutes here. It's great to see you back from injury as well. A clean sheet, first one since a, a 5 0 win, uh, I think in your third game of the season. So that must feel good against such a, a tough opposition. Yeah, thanks, mate. Yeah, it's uh, something we've uh, addressed the last, last few weeks. We have we've been conceding too many uh, sloppy goals. And we've made a real conscious effort today to. Um, make sure we we're safe at the back and, and let our attackers do the rest for us. Uh, Mitch, now, if, if what you're saying to me is true before the game, you've only actually got goals or assists to your name in matches of the round. So what is it about these these live stream games that make you just turn into a I just a enjoy scorer? seeing you, mate, having the, oh, the pre-game chat, all that. And when, when you mentioned to me that I don't have goals or assists outside of that, it gets me right up for it. It was great to have Matty back to get on the end of that. All his experience, um, same as Kempi. We've got some real experienced boys in there now that helped us grind out that result. Clean sheet for us, as you said, is huge. So Fantastic. Very big result for us. Though. Excellent. Um, and, and a good answer there. Now, he, he was free at the back stick down here. Did you notice him or did you just sort of hit it in? He waved it. Yep, he waves at me, so there we go. The universe.
universal wave of kick me the ball. Yeah, excellent. Well, I saw I you, you'll go back and watch it. I said no, he's free the back stick, and then he goes on and scored. So um, that's that's fantastic. Um, now you guys go away. I've already forgotten it. My mind goes blank the second these streams end. But I think you've got Glenwood on Wednesday. Glenwood, Glenwood away on Wednesday. So um, they, they they lost their game today. I, I found out in the middle of the stream. So um, they came off a bit of a high in the match of the round, and they're probably um, not feeling as great now. So. You guys have got to capitalise, I'm sure. Is that what you're, you're hoping? You're just going to go there and, and do what you did today? Oh, absolutely, yeah. The next couple of games are going to be tough. Um, but yeah, it's each, each game, take it as it comes. Um, but as long as the blokes put in what they did today, it should, they should keep going well. Excellent. Now, the last question is, now, something I went off today was the average point. So you guys were second, um, and then your opposition and Oakville were equal first for average points. Um, you guys now move into third, ahead of St Pat's, who also drew today. So, so things are going your way, and you've still got games in hand. Are, are you guys sort of scared by those games in hand at all? Because we saw Burnley this year, they had six to catch up on, and it didn't work for them either. Their, their work seemed cut out for them. It kind of put them off, I guess, having the hindsight and knowing what they had to do. So are you guys sort of worried about that? I'll ask you both separately. Or is that just something that you're going to embrace and, and, and know that you're going to climb back up when you back equal? Oh, look, we've learned from the first set of fixtures that, that no game's easy, and if we come with the right, wrong mindset, thinking about who we're playing rather than actually playing our own game, then then that's where we'll come on stock. So we, our, our job for the next few weeks is to just take each game as it comes, worry about what, what we do and make sure that we apply that to, to the park as best as we can. Sounds similar? Yeah, a bit like what Kempi said. We can only control what we can do. We've got some great squad depth now. We've added some real quality boys in the last couple of weeks. And to be honest, we don't look at the table. We just take each game as it comes and that's helped us pull out performances like tonight. So, so we'll Smash it, guys. Thanks very much for your time. Appreciate Cheers. it. Thanks for having me. Get out of the cold. back to it. <laughs> And now after that match of the round highlights package, we have a look at the table. So that four feet in the o that four feet in the Oakville game has truly shaken up the table. They dropped to second with a game in hand on first place Eastern Creek, who had a midweek recovery after their loss in the match of the round to put them first. But like I said, there's still a catch up game to go. Uh, Tigers are closing the gap uh, on both points wise and the catch up games wise. Uh, equally in second place with Oakville also have a game in hand. So Oakville going from top and looking pretty to perhaps being in a bit of trouble. Prospects go from bottom end of the table to fourth within uh, a couple of games and still with games in hand to catch up on. Uh, St. Pat's has slipped below them. Minchinbury third last, uh, second to last are Spurs and Glenwood still at the bottom. Those, those extra points in the forfeit for Spurs are going to do them a world, a world of good. Uh, there's also some mid-break results to mention uh, before we look at, uh, as I should say, before I uh, showed the table. So... Um, I'll put these in a little bit later. So Eastern Creek actually beat Spurs 3-0 as well in the midweek, while Tigers also made use of their catch-up games, 5-1 winners away to Glenwood. In the PL1, Workers and Parkley played in a replay of last year's match of the round. Uh, workers took the victory in 2021. They also took the victory uh, in the weekend gone by. This time it was a 3-2 scoreline. Doonside Hawks then drew two all against Ropes. Uh, in the kind of fixtures, it's going to be really important in that battle for third and fourth. So particularly if Marion... Uh, pull up their standards to where they have been in the last couple of years. That battle for third and fourth is going to be really, really exciting in the Deploy PL1 in the run-in as we hit the sort of halfway point of the season. So keep an eye on those sort of, not quite mid-table, but mid, mid to upper table games like those. A two-all, probably not the result that either of those guys wanted, but they'll take it nonetheless. Uh, as I find my spot again, um, so Quakers Juniors um, have now been beaten twice in the same se in the same in the same. And they've been beaten twice in the one season uh, by Ponds. So Ponds, with plenty of games to catch up on, plenty of cancellations they've suffered, but they're undefeated, only one draw um, outside of those, those wins that they've had, and they've now beaten first place twice. So the mental edge, perhaps, as they go into the final series, they've already beaten them twice. That's, that's significant. Don't underestimate the willpower that, and the mental edge that that gives you. So in doing that, though, uh, it means that they've now won home and away. Very, very important. Uh, on to the midweek games, and boy, do I wish I was at this one. Rivers and Schofields 5, Polonia 5. So Polonia more than double their goal tally for the entire season in just 90 minutes, but unfortunately conceding 5 down their own end as well meant that uh, it ended with a points shared result. A uh, look at the table now will tell you that Polonia are still last despite having picked up their first points of the season. River Scoey are above them, only two points uh, in total. Uh, a four-all draw and a five-all draw. So entertaining drawers are those Rivo, is that Rivo side, and we'll see if they can change that come the match of the round this weekend against Ropes. Uh, above them, Parkley with one draw and one win from eight. 
Ropes, Marion, Duneside, Workers, and Ponds are all within three points of each other, with Ponds being up in second. It's from second to fourth last. That's how close it is. It's very, very close in the Blue PR1. Ponds do have a lot of games in hand. Quakers are still first. But if Ponds do what Ponds do best, they'll be top soon. Ellie, by the way, if you're watching along, uh, I'm sure you're not, but I know you're busy celebrating the big M. Uh, congrats, by the way. We're going to have to do a full feature-length podcast episode uh, on your celebrations for sure. Uh, congrats to you. Good to see the squad still doing well. Uh, I'm also starting a new trend today. So what I did was I basically went on to Dribble and blindly picked uh, a random league from our list. Uh, and this week, I'm going to share the results, and I'm going to pick a random league each week and share the results on the table. So uh, this week's win- winners, or unlucky winners perhaps, uh, the under-15s Division Three mixed uh, set of teams, where Marsden Park beat Quakers 5-1 away, Minchinbury beat Marion 7-1 away, then Quakers Juniors beat a second Marion team 2-1 uh, on home soil. And that game, uh, before that same Marion team, then lost 6-0 to Minchinbury Jets on a catch-up day uh, on Sunday. So Minchinbury scored 13 goals in 180 minutes, certainly not bad. And a look at the table says that Minchinbury are seven wins from seven, 55 goals scored, seven conceded. So if you happen to be watching along that Minchinbury team from the under-15s mixed Division 3, if you're the coach perhaps watching along, I'm interested in chatting to you. I want to know what your football philosophy is. Uh, Marion Reds are four wins from six in second. Juniors are in third, Marsden Park in fourth. Marion Whites in fifth, Tigers uh, in sixth. On to the Spartans. Now, the boys hosted uh, Northern Tigers. Well, that is the senior boys, I should say. The 20s went down by five goals to one, uh, although the boys won 2-1 against the side who demolished them in round one. So good to see that they had the ability to come back, especially when we were at home. We're quite strong there. Still a chance as it goes to Brown. It's worked in the middle. Denton can't get to it. Rule couldn't neither. Spartans trying to clear it at the end. It dropped back here initially for Lloyd, and then taken down, and it will be a... And it skyrockets over the top. And gone. Oh, jeez, it's on for Young and All. And it's on for Young and All, but it calms down. Fulton's in the middle. Also getting involved is Brown. It calms, it calms, it calms. And Buckley and then headed down initially by Lamberton. And then it was played on here nicely. It's into the area. Can they get a shot in? Chance Lamberton. Well, did he get the touch on there? That's the question. It will be a goal for the Spartans. And I think possession now. They're starting to look dangerous here at the Spartans. Ben Gura has a shot. Safe first time. It's connected by Manny Gonzalez. He makes it a goal. It's 2-0. Wow. What in the world are we witnessing? Just over two minutes in this second half. It's a wide ball here to Rule. Bailey Rule trying to get a cross in. Does so. And it's in. It's a goal. It's somehow gone in. Unfortunately, they then went away to St George City uh, in the Australia Cup and lost, so our run in the Cup is out. He's done for the season, which is a big shame. Uh, it just seems that we're really, really decent at home, but away we're just struggling to find our feet yet. Uh, the youth played against Sydney FC, and they made a statement across a couple of the eight divisions, you know. So the 13s went down 4-2, yes. But the 14s, 15s, and 16s won 3-0, 3-0, and 4-0, respectively. The 18s went down 4-1, though, which is a shame. Uh, in what was the final youth game of the day. As I dramatically throw away that piece of paper, we're getting close to the first interview of the day. Our girls were away to Arpia. The 14s were 4-1 winners to start the day in a positive way. 2-all in the 15s, nil all in the 16s, 2-all again in the 18s. Reserve grade them 1-2-1, but then the first grade suffered their first loss of the season, going down 2-1. A bit of a shame. Didn't play our best in that game, but I can show you the highlights courtesy of NPL TV. An apology goes out to anybody who follows along for the AIL results. The majority of last week's games were cancelled due to the weather, the wet weather. So I apologise for not being aware of that. I'll make sure I'm on top of that next time. So this time they did play, though, against Hills Football uh, on a Sunday here at home. The 13s went down 2-0. The 14s nabbed a 3-2 win to continue being the fantastic team they are. The 15s picking up some good results, a 3-0 win, uh, before the 16s ended the day with a 3-1 loss. Right. Enough of me. Thanks very much for sticking around for the results. It's time to get into our interviews for the day. Like I said, um, Melbourne City, Blacktown Spartans, and uh, future Matildas slash young Matildas goalkeeper Sally James up first, telling you everything you need to know about what it takes to be a professional. Uh, then it's um, Jared from Ropes Crossing Strikers in the Premier League match of the round preview, uh, and me up last. 
So stick around. Gold will be coming at the end, of course. Thanks for sticking here. So far, I'll see you at the end of the video. For our first uh, interview guest of the Blacktown Football Hour podcast this week for episode 13, I'm joined by Sally James, who is Melbourne City's Blacktown Spartans and Young Matilda's goalkeeper um, in our A-League women's competition um, and here at our NPL One, uh, sort of NPL New South Wales women's competition as well. Um, it's a pleasure to have her on here. She got uh, let out of the uh, Young Matilda's training camp, which she's going to be talking all about of today um, at 9.15 this morning, and she's... I've been kind enough to make her way here to the office and, and is willing to have a chat about all things Young Matildas and uh, World Cups coming up and training camps and the like. So uh, sit back and relax and enjoy this one uh, because it's going to be a good one, I think. So Sally, first of all, thanks so much for joining us here. Thank you for having me. Excellent. So uh, it's great to have you in. And um, of, of all people, um, someone who's so experienced already and has been around here for so long, uh, it's great to have you in. And, and plenty of people will know your face as well. So I think it's great. Um, first things first, you've, you've just come out of a training camp, like I mentioned. Can you explain to me what a training camp actually looks like? So that could mean, I think what I want to start with is when you first get that call up, you get that team list, um, and it was a 27-strong person list. Uh, you get that list, what happens from there? Are you then given a, a time and place to meet? Where is that? Where was that? Go from there. Yes, so uh, you first get uh, an email if you're selected from the team manager. And then that usually gives you your, your check-in date, so the beginning of camp. Uh, so then you rock up whatever time it, uh, it's, it stipulates um, to come in and you park your car, you walk into the hotel, uh, you check in, you get your kit and then your room key and then you find out um, which person that you're going to be rooming with. And then you kind of just follow the, the daily schedule, which is usually put out on like a WhatsApp chat or something like that. Um, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner, your training times, uh, recovery times, things like that. And then um, the time that you need to be back in your room before bed. For sure. So how much time is there between finding out the, the list and, and sort of day one? Um, there's usually about a week. They like to give a bit of notice so girls that, you know, have jobs and things like that can um, organise to move their shifts around or let their bosses know or girls that have school can um, speak to their teachers and things like that. Is that something that, uh, like, is sort of in, like, a, like a when they do part-time work, is that something that's in their contract that they have to, you know, I'm going to get called up to represent Australia? Is that something that they sort of talk about with their employees? Is that something you know about? Um, I, I guess I would think so. Uh, yeah, we have a, a kind of like a coordinator. Um, her name's Janet. She kind of helps us um, coordinate or balance, I guess you could say, um, our work and our school with our employees. She can send an email out, let them know what's happening, and it really helps us out because we feel like a lot less pressure to try and like balance work and football together. Absolutely. Um, and, and you're someone who's balancing uh, playing for Spartans here as well. Obviously, the, the drive is great because you're at the same place for this end, YM. But um, yeah, obviously, you, your schedule is, is very busy as well. So I know I haven't written this down. I'm putting you on the spot again. But what, what does a normal week look like for you? Or, or what has this week or two... Actually, no. What has the last two weeks looked like? So before the training camp here with Spartans and then now into the training camp. Uh, so I'll start from like a Sunday. So we've got game day. Mm -hmm. So you play. And then uh, you wake up the next day on the Monday. That's usually like a recovery session um, or a day off. So we'd have Pilates in the morning maybe at 8 a.m. Uh, online. And then you refuel, um, recharge, things like that. Then you go back into training on Tuesday, um, which is like kind of like another startup session. Then Wednesday is kind of like your harder session. Um, we'll have gym two times per week as well. Uh, Thursday, I'm here with Blacktown, MPL. And Friday... Uh, back in with FMs, so training there. Um, and then Saturday is the day off before the game and then you play on Sunday again. For sure. Now, for this training camp specifically, is that different? So what did that five, what did each of those five days sort of look like? Yes, yeah, so first day we came in was a Monday. So we had uh, the usual like rest and recovery, stretch, roll, active mobility, things like that. Um, and then on day two, that's when we got into training. Um, we had a double session. And then we had another double session. Uh, and then we did some gym as well. And then we played a game uh, yesterday, so Thursday, against Blacktown, 14, 15 boys. Uh, today it's Friday. And we did a bit of recovery. We went in, had uh, individual like player meetings where you debrief the camp kind of with your coach. And, uh, yeah, massages, which is nice. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, so, yeah, so this morning when you get out at 9.15, is there anything that really happens on mornings like this or is it just a thanks for coming and goodbye? Uh, you, after you have like your debrief or your IPP, 
um, individual player plan, I think that stands for. Uh, with your coach, it's kind of, yeah, um, you just you leave camp, you take your kit back, drop everything off, and then yeah. off you go. Excellent. So just in reflection of, of what this camp has been like, obviously you're, you're doing things in that you're involved in every week, but this intensive sort of camp just behind us here to our right, um, good experience, I guess? Yeah, really good experience. Um, it's really good to get in with a bunch of girls from all across the country. Um, everyone wants to play well, everyone wants to perform, the intensity is really high, a um, lot of information, so you're learning a lot of new things each day, and uh, yeah, it's a really good environment. Excellent. Um, again, I'm, I'm throwing you under the bus here, but what's that team environment like? Obviously, it's very competitive, um, and that's yep. something our, our viewers might not be able to mm -hmm. sort of understand without being there, but obviously, you guys have, you got, a lot of you guys have done and been in squads before. But in the end, you're, you're competing for 11 play, places on the pitch. You, in particular, are the hardest in being in that goalkeeper position, of course. So, is does that balance of yeah, we're good, we're good friends, but yeah, there's res like we're, we respect everyone that we're all going for the same thing. Is that something that you guys will just sort of understand? Yeah, for sure. It's kind of like an unspoken rule, like mm. off the pitch. You know, I mean, you leave it all on the pitch. You train hard. You work hard because you are there fighting for that spot, but. Off the pitch, everyone's friends. Like um, you got to set that aside, and ultimately, when the environment is good off the pitch, that translates to on the pitch. So excellent. Yeah, that's what I like to hear. Now, the young Matildas are actually going off to, to New Zealand pretty soon. Obviously, there's, there's going to be a squad announced for that, um, and of course, hopefully, you're in that squad as well. Uh, but for your previous experiences, where you guys have gone overseas um, or you've gone interstate to Canberra, like you mentioned before, um, off camera, by the way. Um, what, what does interstate or overseas travel look like? Is it similar to a camp except this time you meet at an airport? What does it look like? Um, so interstate, uh, you kind of are asked by the manager what um, airport you'd fly out from uh, and then they kind of organise your flights for you. You jump on a flight, head to camp um, and then they kind of look after you really. They give you a, a card from the airport to, to the hotel. You check in, same thing as usual, um, you know, get your bag, follow the schedule. When in doubt, follow the schedule. Um, yeah, you kind of just, they all provide, they provide all the information and tell you all the steps that you need to do. And then so, just go from there. So that was more interstate, but when you go overseas in particular, I just want to bring it back to that for a second. Is that, oh, is that a more strenuous and, and stressful process? Is that, or is that just the same sort of thing? Everyone gets their own flights and you meet in the other country? Um, I would imagine so. I say imagine because I haven't actually been to a, uh, another country for a camp before. Um, I guess with COVID, uh, our cycle or our age group hasn't really done that, uh, at least in the young Matildas cycle anyway. Um, I know a couple of girls did when it was junior Matildas, mm. but um, yeah, because of COVID, we haven't really had the opportunity to go overseas for a long time. So um, yeah, I, I'm thinking we would all meet at the same state that we're flying out from and then uh, fly in to whatever country we're going to from there. Are you someone who enjoys flying? Oh gosh, I mean, growing up, I never really flew around much. Like, I haven't really been outside of Australia. I think I did maybe when I was like two, and then uh, last year once. But um, yeah, I like flying, why not? Good. good, that's good to hear. I'm, I'm sure that's not the same with everyone. There's, there's plenty of people who don't like it, but um, it's good to know that you're doing well. Um, obviously this camp uh, and everything that's going towards like everything you do outside of this five-day uh, intensive camps are going towards august now august is when the under 23 women's world cup is it's being held in costa rica um we have a pretty uh, hectic group uh, as well that we're going to be up against brazil uh, spain uh, and then the host as well costa rica uh, but is that uh, obviously uh, i'm not trying to assume you'll make the squad but uh, provided you make the squad um is that something you're you're really excited and looking forward to yeah, really excited, really excited. A um, bit nerve-wracking, mm. but, I mean, it's such a big occasion. It's a World Cup. It happens every four years. Um, yeah, nerve-wracking, exciting, um, especially playing the first game as well against Costa Rica in Costa Rica. I'm sure the atmosphere is going to be insane. Like, I think the amount of people that we've heard, you know, we've heard rumours of the amount of people that might come, and it's just mind-boggling, mm. especially for... Um, considering the growth in women's football as well, there's, to know that there's going to be so many people there, it's definitely a bit daunting, but yeah, for sure exciting. Absolutely. I was, in the, I was at the Matildas games when, when Brazil came to town. I was at the first game um, back at what was formerly known as Combank Stadium, the, the one in Parramatta. 
um, and it was it was the, what the South Americans bought was fantastic. I don't think Costa Rica doesn't actually qualify as uh, South America, but just sort of that that America's area is is extremely passionate, and the, the female game is no different to the the men's game there, and, and it's great to see it being just as supported as as the men's variation. Uh, look, as you know, um, and we're bringing it back home to Spartans now, uh, 10 of the 27 girls selected uh, wear the orange and black uh, on a Sunday as well. So obviously you're one of them, uh, but there's nine others as well. So do you think that actually provides that extra bit of chemistry, knowing that you guys are actually training one time extra per week and you guys get along that little bit better because you see each other a bit more than, than the rest of the squad? How, how, how was that experience and, and, and was it helpful? Uh, I mean, I think I'm in the fluoro pink or fluoro yellow or whatever. Or oh, I think we've got a white kit now too, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, it's invaluable. I think, just generally speaking, the more that you see or the more that you play with uh, another player, the more familiar you get with them. You know how they work. You know what type of runs they make. You know their strengths. Um, so, yeah, it definitely helps in link-up play and, um, you know, playing with them um, – you trust them as well. It builds off. It builds, and you also have that uh, off-field rapport as well. So yeah, it really helps for sure. So when we when will we see you guys all back um, in in Spartan training, for example? Uh, all the big the game this Sunday. Yeah, the game this Sunday, um, and then yeah, back for a normal week, and then Spartan training again on Thursday. But tell me when you have these these camps like this, and you do miss a week of training um, with the Spartans. That is. Yep. Do you, how easy is it to just switch off how young Matildas play and then back into the way we play, for example? Is that something that has been difficult and is now a bit easier or is that a pretty seamless transition? Um, I'd say it's pretty seamless. I think uh, maybe when I was a bit younger, I'd find it more difficult. Um, but I think now, yeah, it's a bit easier. I think there are a lot of similarities um, between the way you know young Matildas and Blacktown play, especially with just your core things, you know you you want to be aggressive, um, you want to be you want to have a really good mentality, um, you want to win every challenge. So just the the core things, um, they all stay the same. So yeah, it makes that transition a lot easier. Excellent. Well, my final question to you regards the the young kids that are watching along, young girls, young boys, who have dreams and aspirations of, of playing at, at at you know national representative level, uh, A League women's, A League men's level. You're someone who these kids will look up to uh, and that will only grow uh, as you grow into your, your position as well. What's the piece of advice you have for, for, for young kids watching along? Um, what's something that you think, a bit of expertise, maybe a bit of, yeah, I think a bit of expertise that you could share with them? Um, I mean, a classic one is never give up. Like, I think um, in your career or when you're playing, you're never going to be perfect. It's, I think it's impossible to have a perfect game. Learn how to deal with mistakes early. Um, you know, get a mentor, speak to your coach, things like that. Um, so you can address it early and, you know, don't let it eat you up. Um, yeah, believe in yourself and, um, yeah, just be, have fun with it because mm -hmm. you play well when you're having fun. If you put too much pressure on yourself, that's when you start to overthink and um, it, can, it can get challenging and you might not st you might like you know lose that love for the game a little bit so yeah just have fun with it remember why you started almost out of the woods oh, one more question in relation to goalkeeping specifically that's that was a great answer by the way but with goalkeeping specifically that's a position that's so it's very much judged on what you do wrong rather than for do sure right. yeah um and you would know better than anybody not because you make mistakes but because you've lived that position for mm -hmm. so long now mm -hmm. for goalkeepers watching along of any age really what's your guide for how to get over that mental game? It is probably the most difficult position in any sport, to be honest. Um, so, but what's your guide to just being able to reset? Sometimes if things don't go your way. For sure, yeah. Goalkeeping is definitely a very mental position. Like, it requires a lot of um, mental strength. I think um, I was speaking to someone the other day and we were just talking about that classic saying. I think it was Ika Casillas, actually. Um, it was like, you know, as a goalkeeper, or something along the lines of this, um, as a goalkeeper, you remembered... Um, by your mistakes versus as a striker, you kind of remembered. Like, you're forgiven if, you know, you miss six goals and you score one, all's forgiven. But a goalkeeper, you could make, you know, ten good saves in a game, save a worldie, but then if you let one through your legs or something, then everyone remembers you for that. Um, I think to help get over that, it's just acknowledging that um, is, a, is a good starting point. Um, have people that you talk to off the pitch um, and know that, you know, your performance on the pitch doesn't equate to your worth as a person off the pitch. I think that's a massive thing. 
Um, don't let it get you down in the dumps. Address it and address it early. Don't let it, you know, eat you up for a couple of weeks. You know, if you make a mistake, I like to watch it. Um, I don't like to, I think beforehand I used to not watch the footage back and pretend that it didn't happen, but now I watch it. I see what I could have done better. Maybe laugh, keep it lighthearted. We're going to make mistakes. Um, yeah, and then move on. Excellent. That's that's really good advice. Not only the the footballing side of things, but the, the mental health aspect and, and how to recover. That's a fantastic answer in, in all honesty. So, um, look, Sally, you, you've you've been fantastic in this interview and I appreciate you coming in. So thanks very much for your time. Best of luck with everything coming up to not only you, but the rest of the squad as well. Um, and I think we'll move on to the next segment now. Cool. Thank you. Our second interviewee guest of today as part of our Blacktown Football Hour podcast is Jared from Ropes Crossing. It's finally uh, time to get Ropes Crossing personnel on our Blacktown Football Hour podcast. It's been far too uh, long uh, since we've had them in the ma Match of the Round live streams, and I think it's great that we have Jared here to, to chat for us. He's one of uh, part of the leadership team there um, of what's a vastly different squad to what we saw last season who play a different style of football, and we're going to sort of debunk all those things here today. So, Jared, first of all, thanks so much for joining us here. No worries, mate. Glad to be here. Excellent. So, I think I want to start, first of all, with a, with a bit of praise. Um, obviously, I won't blow smoke too much, but you guys had a pretty poor, poor season. I'm sure you won't mind saying that now, considering you've already outdone your points tally at this point of the season compared to where we finished last time. Um, at the foot, last time, nowhere near that this time. Um, now that's come with a couple of changes and I think we should talk about that uh, in the most respectful way possible. So uh, there's been a second change of coach as we talked about just, just then off camera um, and we should talk about uh, what's changed. So I want to I think about the, the vibe of the team, um, you know, uh, how sort of your approach to training has, has changed since the changes. Um, what's making you guys play better football uh, in the last couple of weeks? So to begin, it's just, yeah, it's a good culture that's uh, starting to come into the club. We're uh, being treated more professionally and more in a way so that you would want to be treated if you're playing in the MPL. And it's, it's a good change to the club. Uh, you've got the boys coming into each training session with like just a better, more positive vibe. They want to go out there and fight for their spots. And it's just, it's looking really positive, man. Good. Um, and, and you're someone who's... Um survived both seasons, uh, so this season and the one prior. Um, and obviously, you know, it, it's difficult to go through a change of squad, but first of all, congrats to you for, for being able to maintain, and it's good to see you now thriving in uh, the, the rejuvenated side. We should talk about that, and in comparison to where you guys were last year to this year, are you and any of those other, I hate to say, but surviving players, are you guys coming with a bigger smile on your face now to every training session and game day? So obviously it's not the best thing in the world taking a loss and coming off the end of last season it's um it was a time to rebuild so the club's in that process of trying to rebuild build that uh momentum into the end of the season but for right now it's it's yeah being one of those surviving players and coming to each training session yeah this, you can say there's a big smile on my face and a lot of the other players as well excellent now you guys uh, started with a with a win uh, a loss and then a win then a loss and then a second loss uh, and then most recently a, a draw against Doonside. Now, in terms of where that has you on the table, uh, it's just sort of uh, just below mid, but obviously everyone's played on an uneven amount of games. Uh, the, the top sort of two and, and three are pretty strong this year. I think Quakers, uh, who, who you lost to the hands at, and, and quite convincingly, um, but that's fine. Uh, but they're a strong established squad, and, and Ponds as well, even though they've played the least amount of games in the entire Premier League, um, are, are strong two up in second. Now... The battle for third and fourth, uh, Marion, will, you would imagine, will, will pick up things when they catch up on their games as well. So really third and fourth between new Marion workers who are rejuvenated as well um, and Dune side. So I don't think it's unrealistic to say that you're, you're competing for two spots in that final series rather than, than four. Um, but is that the goal of the club is to, is to end up in either that third or fourth spot? So yeah, coming off the end of last season, obviously, as I said earlier, we're in that station of rebuilding. So I think pushing for that top four would be our end of season goal and obviously progressing even further. But yeah, that top four position would be look very nice on the end of last season. Absolutely. Uh, now you actually have an undefeated record against uh, Doonside so far. Um, yet to play Marion. Uh, workers you have a win over as well. So those teams around you competing, you've actually... I could say you struck a bit of fear into them, I'd say. So that's definitely a positive sign going into, maybe not this game this weekend for the match of the round, but when you come to face these guys for a second time. Yeah, 100%. Look, like top three teams, workers, 
Quakers, Marion Ponds, top top four there. You've got good good groups of like players, good teams, and for us to come away with some positive results against those teams, I think I think we are one of the teams this year. We're one of the teams to beat, and we're showing that with our results. Excellent. Now, showing it with the results and then being able to, to explain why things are happening is, is totally different. Now, we, we, Riverston have been on the match of the round already this season, so you've been able to watch them, of course. Uh, obviously, Dune Sides featured t- uh, twice already. Like I said, we're, we're yet to see you guys. Now, I don't want you to give anything away, but I'd like to sort of get a glimpse into what's the ropes crossing way of football. The ropes crossing way. Uh, with changing of coaches and everything that's happened at the club, where kind of building from the ground up, seeing what's working for us. And without giving too much away, I think it's a matter of just stepping on the throat from the start of the game, just pushing, pushing, pushing right from the get-go, not waiting back too much, just going for it. It's only 90 minutes, anything can happen, and we're there for the whole 90. Excellent. Um, that, that's been a thing that sometimes teams have struggled with so far this season, it's maintaining it all the way to the end of the end of the game so if, you, if that's something you guys can really knuckle down on um, and, and having spoken to players is it, is it there is that little uh, added level of pressure when it comes to the match, whether it's match of the round or the big crowd or uh, being the sort of showpiece game um, so it's, it's important to make sure that doesn't sort of get to your head as, as being part of that leadership team and someone who's been here for a number of years how can you sort of get into the change room come come Saturday evening and make sure everyone's got a level head so obviously with our previous results, we don't want to get too, too overconfident coming into these games. Any team can win on the day, and it's evident in soccer, that's what happens. Um, making sure that all 32 players in the squad are ready. It's not a first grade thing or a reserve grade thing. It's we're a whole squad, we're 32 players, and we're there to take the six points. So obviously getting in, making sure everyone's prepared, everyone's ready. Coach, always professional, keeping everyone level-headed. Yeah, it's, it's a good vibe. Absolutely. That's what I like to hear. Um, as well, and we, we've spoken about Riverson already, but uh, we, you have been able to watch them, which might be seen as an advantage perhaps, but you've been able to see them. Uh, it was a 4-2 loss to Doonside on their own turf um, that, they, that they had. So um, have you guys taken, a, taken upon yourselves to, to look at that game and, and see where perhaps you could exploit the opposition? Yeah, of course. We were tasked with watching the Riverston game after it happens. And yeah, of course, we've taken away some pointers, some things that we can work on, some things that we don't want to, or well, I wouldn't have done want to, but things that we can work on in their positives. But it's, yeah, it's, it's a work in progress and watching the Riverston game over and over, it's positive for the team. Excellent. Now, something else that's really troubled teams this year has been squad depth. Um, and it's been a blessing to have a 20, 20s team, um, sorry, 21s team, I've just lost my brain there, and a reserve grade team as well. So uh, in terms of the ability to rotate and in terms of playing, uh, you know, funneling the same style of football to those, um, to those uh, you know, reserve and, and, and 20s, is there a possibility for, for those reserve grade players to come off the bench and have an impact because they know how first grade play? Is that something that you guys are, have incorporated this season? Yeah, 100%. So unfortunately, Ropes doesn't have a 21s 20, yeah. team. So we only have the 32 players that we can use. And we're lucky enough that our squad is very interchangeable. Mm. A lot of players from Resis will come up and help first grade whenever needed. Well, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so unfortunately Ropes doesn't have a 21s team, so it's been a little bit unfortunate not having those players to be able to come up and help, but I think a positive out of that is that we have a very tight-knit team of 32, and both Rezies and first grade fight for that first grade spot, so mm-hmm. it's very interchangeable. We don't train apart, we're th- like a squad of 32, so training's similar, and there's always a player that's going to try and fight for that spot in first grade happened with me last year like I was in resis at the start of the season broke into first grade and here I am excellent and it's that perseverance that can get you to that top level absolutely you're one of the perhaps fortunate teams to actually have a home game on your on your turf uh, at ropes crossing reserve uh, which like I said we haven't been to since round two of last year so um, now your your home record isn't like I'm not gonna say it's standoutish but obviously it's still an advantage in itself so are you guys happy to be able to you know, welcome your, 
your, your ropes crossing fans and fellow players and parents to, to stick along to the end of the game for the showpiece game and build an atmosphere and you're, you're familiar with the, the shape and size of the pitch, for example? Yeah, 100%. It's always an advantage being at home. And even better, we've got the ropes crossing fair that's happening on that night. So there'll be a little bit of a bigger crowd than what there usually is, but having those extra people there supporting ropes crossing and having all the younger teams coming and watching, it's, it's going to be a good vibe. Excellent. Now, my final, final question for you, unless something else pops into my brain, but the expectation this weekend and for every weekend, I imagine, for you guys is, is three points. Am I correct? Yeah, 100%. Excellent. So um, very keen to see you guys out there. Uh, thanks very much for joining us here, by the Thank way. Thank you. Thanks for Appreciate having me. Appreciate your time. Yeah, good morning, guys. It's Bill Owen here. I've got Mark DiPoli, our media manager and expert. I've got Bianca at the back on the camera. Guys, it's the Red Shield appeal today, and um, I'm going to take some time in and sit with Mark. Mark handles our social media and our media. And we're going to do it quite ad lib, we're going to do it quite casually. And um, Mark's a bit nervous at the moment because he's wondering what I'm going to do to him. But we're just going to give an opportunity because no Mark would be better on what he does. So, Mark, favourite food, mate? Let's start off with that. Oh, I, I, can't, I can't go against my Italian route, so it's got to be something Italian, whether it's uh, a pizza or a spaghetti bolognese. I'll probably say the spaghetti bolognese, actually. Why, when you're young Italian, you've got to put that bolognese twist at the back end of it. What's all that? Just about? look, it's, it's actually. It's actually it's actually disrespectful to my family if I don't. I actually will go home and I'll get sent to my room. Yeah, so. Okay. And my nonna will probably hit me on the backhand me. So I've got to be really careful because um, she'll watch this and then she'll be happy now that I've got it right. All right. How many brothers and sisters you got, mate? I've got one sister. She's five years my junior. All right, beautiful. And um, mum and dad, Italian, they both born here in Australia? Or that one's from Italy or come in or a family? They're, no, they're second generation, so both born here. Uh, mm-hmm. mum's, mum's of a Maltese and Australian background, so... Um, two, two Italian grandparents who were born overseas, um, technically one on the Slovenian border as well. Um, but yeah, the Australian and the Maltese side comes from my mum's side. Beautiful, okay. High school, where'd you go to high school, mate? Oh, yeah, back in the hills in a place called Kellyville, suburb called Kellyville. Uh, school was called William Clark College. Um, quite a, you know, a nice sounding, sounding private school, but um, you know, it was, it's, it's gotten me here so far, so I'm pretty happy. All right, mate, now... You've now been with us a good number of months now in the BDSFA and you look after media across all platforms, referees, branch, Spartans, community, mini rooms, mum's done a lot of things. What are some of the challenges you've had to face, mate? Uh, the challenges are trying to stick to sort of a, a media routine when uh, things come up, uh, like, a, like a one-off thing, like a, when we were doing the Spartans uh, Australia Cup and, you know, you, you take one day out to prepare for that and it throws the rest of your week out. That, that can be challenging. Um, Trying to create content while there's there's been rain delays, um, and and trying to make sure that we're giving all clubs uh, equal time on, on our pages, you know when some of them are playing here on a on a match of the round, and that might be the only game that happens, and it might look like we're promoting too much, but really it's just we're going off what we can. So um, I find that to be to be challenging, but realistically I come from um, a space where in my junior years I never played for any of these clubs. Uh, heard about them, you know, through the grapevine, but never ever played for them. So my affiliation is with none. Um, so really, it's it's just my my goal to make sure that they're all being promoted equally. So, okay. And what about when you're prior to coming last year? Obviously, we heard you doing some um, calling in the racing and not the racing, the football, and and obviously you must practice at home and um, and sort of have your favourites and talk about games. And has that helped you in in transitioning to this role? Because obviously, I listened to you the other night and. You do do your research, which is lovely, and you, you go back through some of the games and you compare some of the old stats of people. Mm-hmm. So it means you're quite fanatical, which is a great thing when you come to sport and you're passionate mm-hmm. for it. And um, long-term, journalism, media, what do you think? Well, first of all, I, I appreciate that, and I'm glad you, you watch along and um, recognise where, where my hours go into. But, uh, yeah, so journalism background, studying it at UTS, um, so it's taken me very far. I had a community based volunteer role at a, a radio station called 2SER, which was linked to UTS uh, and also Macquarie. I uh, worked there for 15 to 18 months, I do believe, um, and, it, and it got me working quite well. So uh, that was all part of it. But yeah, I think that's where I want to continue on. And, and when you spoke about what I was doing to get ready for this role and transition into this role, that was one of the things. But also I used to have a, a YouTube channel where I would stream for four, five, six, seven hours sometimes. and. Uh, into all hours of the morning, and um, that sort of got my, my interest in commentary um, peaking, I guess you could say. Okay, what about a role model in the media world that you'd follow in sport? Like, is mm. it a Robbie Slater, is it a Mark oh. Foster, or is it a Bozzy, or who is it? Like, is there a particular commentator, a, a, 
you know, that you would say, I'd like to be a bit of Simon Hill or people like that in sport. Um, it could be a bit of female of any sort. Oh, you know? no, for sure. Uh, and, good and, safe. Yeah, great safe, good hands, you know. And, um, and any role model, who, you know? Um, purely from a, a commentating perspective, I, I think the, the poetry of, uh, the, the word poetry of uh, Peter Drury overseas uh, in terms of English and Champions League commentating is, is, is the best of, the, of my generation. Um, I think domestic-wise, um, it was always Simon Hill for me. So when I could start to comprehend what the world was and 2005 came along and we, and we made it to the World Cup for the first time mid-November of that year, even though I was four, it's one of my earliest, earliest sort of footballing memories. So um, that was also his first year here as part of um, being a commentator in Australia. So he's been a big influence. Craig Foster as well for what he does inside of football and outside of football. I think it's great to have him back via Stan as well. I called him Mark Foster, didn't I? I, I think it I might did, have, yeah. I might apologise have. for that, Craig. I'm all over the shop. Yeah, he, but he's obviously watching along. He'll get it. He's, Absolutely. He's, un, he's understanding. He'll be on our no. podcast. Yeah, exactly. No, he's <laughs> fine. Um, he, he's wonderful. I um, had a chat to him once for my old, my old YouTube channel, so he was, he's, he's great. Um, and I think he has great things to say about the sport as well. Right. Now, within our sport, we're fortunate in Blacktown. We've got some really fantastic women in our sport mm. that are in leadership roles, be it on the board at Blacktown, mm. be it both at Spartans, and at the BDSFA, and as club leaders, club secretaries, and committee people right across the board in the community, and, and they're a big yeah. backbone and a, and a big um, positive to what we do in Blacktown, because we really want to empower women in women's football, and, and, and more so in the fact that next year we're hosting the World Cup. Mm -hmm. So you've obviously monitored a lot of the females that we've had, the girls that have come through our program, and as we head into the World Cup, standout stars for you that you've seen come through the program. Oh, th through our program? Yeah. yeah okay. Um, obviously, um, Courtney Nevin and, and Kyra Cooney Cross, watching them when I first came here, um, I wasn't too understanding of how you could go from A-League women's, at the time, W-League, to the NPL space. It wasn't, uh, wasn't a bit of knowledge I had, but when I figured out that you'd do both, one in the in-season, one in the off-season, I thought that was fantastic. It was great to watch them. Um, I think at the moment, I think Jessica Nash at right back has been fantastic, and at 17, she's got so long to go. Jamila Rankin at the opposite fullback has been fantastic. Um, I think Ash Crofts uh, deserves a mention as well. She got a poker, that's four goals the other day. So we, we've had some great people who've already represented at that level, um, and to have some, some fresh faces in this year as well has been great. Um, and as someone who, when I first started in sort of my, my, my weekend work only here before I moved into my new role, um, Spartans girls is something that I was doing. I, I was I was doing the ground announcing, I should say, and it was it, like the, the the love I have for those teams and the desire I have to see those guys succeed is, is huge. So um, there's some really great characters as as well as there are great footballers. So those guys in particular are, are ones that I'm I'm backing as 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 much as anyone. And what's your view on our Phoenix League? You've obviously got our Granville women and our yeah. Blacktown women playing in a competition that I think is second to none, and it really cross-pollinates across all religions, genders, and again, it allows people the opportunity that are willing to open up and adapt and, and accept change to allow the sport to grow and empower young girls from the youngest age to the oldest age to play and participate in sport. And I think it's a credit to Blacktown and Granville, and you obviously see that going around the grounds. Is there areas out there that you think we could do it better in that space? Uh, I, okay, good question. Um, and putting me on the spot, but that's all part of it. Uh, in honesty, I'd love to see, and, I, and I've heard a little bit um, about when we were doing Female Football Week and having a chat to some of the coaches who have been around for a while, there's a lot of effort that um, you know, both BDSFA and GDSFA teams are putting into making sure that their, their men's Premier League and you know, what was formerly called women's Premier League are both equally promoted and it's, it gets the highlight um, sort of match when they get to host their Premier League men and women's teams. So... Um, it's, it's my job to make sure that that's also something that we promote equally here. Beautiful. Now, in time, if that means a match of the round uh, on a Sunday um, for, the, for the women, why not? I'm happy to put my hand up for that. I've commentated three, four games in, in a week plenty of times, uh, and I, I would suggest, I'd like to suggest I could hold my standard for all, all three or four, but ha having the one on the Saturday and one on the Sunday is, is something that I think is wonderful. I, I think it'd be great to do that if we can find the time to organise that. I think that's one step we can go towards. Um, I'd love to see, um, we have Martin, a fantastic photographer on the board, um, and being able to get him in, and he's so willing to help out um, with our men's Premier League, to get the all Age Division 1, um, you know, get some signage around the place as well, I think it'd be great. So 
that's all something that I can be a part of and, and put suggestions towards. And, and who knows, maybe we'll get that uh, commentated in game once a week next year. OK, now we'll lighten it up a bit here now, because you are a bit of an English football fan. <laughs> I'm a West Ham supporter. And yes. I'm a, I'm a tragic. And uh, so your passion, your team, Liverpool, Man oh. City, where are we at? Oh. OK, so the, the honest truth is when I was in Year 6, um, someone said to me, be an Arsenal fan, and I said, OK. Um, and so here we are, what, 10 years later now. Um, a poor end to the season after what was a poor start, and by that I mean the first three games. Um, and then it, and then it got better, and then it ended quite poorly. So, um, you know, at the tails and the head, we, we were poor. Um, but in the middle, it was fantastic, and we dreamed. Um, in, in truth, I, I wish I'd never picked a, such a high-up club team. I've, I've got a friend who's a, who's a Villa fan, and obviously having spoken to you off-camera about West Ham, it's just I, I, have a, I have a desire to support a team that's not, you know, quote-unquote successful all the time. But I chose Arsenal, so I stick to them. Um, and... You know, we'll see what next next year with a bit of European competition pull, even though it's sort of the B-Tech one. Um, we'll see what kind of players that, uh, the Gunners can pull and um, if they can th uh, thicken up that squad a little bit. OK, beautiful. You've also you've mentioned your favourite food and that, so a bit of home housekeeping out. Do you do your own washing at home? Yeah. Um, Seriously? Yeah. Um, your age? Yeah. How so, um, and, and my sister does as well, so she's fantastic. Beautiful. Um, uh, I have to now because by the time I get home after a long day of media and, and, and doing interviews after after normal business hours, uh, then no one else is awake. So, um, so I've got to make sure that I do it myself. Uh, my parents probably suggest that I don't do it as much as I should, but, <laughs> but um, no, I try my best. <laughs> right, uh, can you cook? Ooh, um, I do the basics very well. Um, the my ability to cook things that don't require a recipe right in front of me is not great just yet, um, but I'm trying. So you know, hopefully, if you know, hopefully people watching along who would would care about that um, would you know, hopefully I don't make myself look too bad. But I am trying. I am trying. <laughs> but it's hard when you're young. But listen, guys, that's just some time with Marty. The opportunity to know Mark and um, obviously Bankers on the camera and Mark's building a media team on the weekend. They come around. They work. And they're working for the better of the association. It's something we've worked and, and um, starting to get more and more involved with because it engages with the membership. And, and Mark's at the forefront of that. So, guys, if you've got stuff, you've got his email address, send it in, and we'll try and keep up. But, Mark, thank you very much for your time here today. And um been an absolute pleasure. And I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but you've oh, done okay. great. And Bianca's done fantastic. So all the best, guys. I think that was a really good episode. Um, first of all, Sally, to, to kick us off, was fantastic. Um, and... Uh, now that I've recorded this after I actually did the interview, um, she might not get to this far in the episode, but she was fantastic. Um, not too much media training those guys have had. They'll need it before the World Cup, certainly. Uh, might think about hosting something, who knows. Um, but she spoke really well, and that's what it takes to be the best. Um, and she's on a path to get there, as are the rest of that 27-woman uh, squad. So best of luck to them in their preps as they go off to New Zealand, as it's been officially announced now via social media. Jared spoke really well. Uh, it's not been easy to sort of describe what's been happening at, at ropes in terms of management changes and coach changes, uh, but he did a really good job, so good to speak to him as well. Can't wait to see what they do uh, in the match of the round tomorrow. Uh, and me, I did terribly, so I hope you didn't find me too interesting because that's as good as it gets. I'm not going to do anything else because hopefully Bill, our chairman, doesn't come and ask me any of the difficult questions. But yes, my favourite food is spaghetti bolognese. Sorry for saying it like that. It is what it is. Goal of the week. This week's BDSFA Goal of the Week, as brought to you by our good friends at LJ Hooker Blacktown, was scored by Ryan Davey from the Under-14s Division 2 side from Doonside Hawks. After a couple of blocked shots, it just sat perfectly for young Ryan, and sometimes when you hit them, they stay hit. I'd like you to take notice of two things. Number one, his reaction, and the second one being the reaction from the crowd. It tells you everything you need to know. This was truly a special, special goal. Absolutely worthy of winning the goal of the week for this week. Congrats to you, Ryan. You proved that sometimes you've just got to hit it. I think it's time to finally wrap up the episode. So, uh, what a great goal of the week, by the way. Uh, Ryan Davey, if my memory serves me correctly, that's a strike and a half. Uh, either you're 13 or 14 years old, or could even be younger, and you're hitting a ball like that. Props to you. Keep sending them in. Goal at bdsfa.com. They come straight to my inbox, which is media at bdsfa.com. You can send them to either. Really send them to both. So we de so definitely get it. Fantastic goals. Great to see so many being sent in. Cue the outro music. 
Goodbye.